check. Check, check. Yeah. Manoj, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Dr. Biju Raju. And uh, it was a pleasure having you over. And I know we all enjoyed it thoroughly. And anything you'd like to say before you leave? Because a lot of people from Eli Prasad have been listening to you. Oh, live. <laughs> and, this, and I must say, this is the first time that anybody has played a one man band show live on Zoom. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I definitely think so because um, if Manoj says I have done it, uh, then that means, uh, I mean, he knows everything. <laughs> so he has told me that this is the first time he has uh, done something like this because he is a live sound engineer. He does so many shows. So I'm so happy that, you know, I got this platform. I'm, 
I'm so thankful to Dr. Vaibhav. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It's a great honor to play for all my friends from LVP and to all the great surgeons and teachers uh, in retina. Um, people like uh, Dr. Steve Charles, whom we've grown up learning retina from, it's, and Dr. SJ, all those people are great. I'm so proud that I'm here in this uh, program, starting off the proceedings with on a lighter note for the heavier discussions to come later. And uh, Thank you. We, we have 10 minutes, 10 minutes with us, and okay. there is a, you know, a proposal in the chat box if we can have an impromptu one number from you, even if it's not one man band, it's okay. only you. Live. Yeah, give us I, some... I, 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 yeah, I think I can do that, but uh, just give me a minute to tune sure, the sure, guitar. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Biju Raju has been working on this since the last three, four days, having sleepless nights. It's tougher than a vitrectomy because it requires live streaming and proper coordination. By the time Dr. Biju Raju prepares for the song, I'd like to welcome everyone to Pan of Salmonica Reloaded. And uh, so a special thanks to all the faculty, the moderators, the panelists for taking the time out. And uh, we hope to have exciting sessions after this musical feast. And uh, I hope every everyone is as excited as me. Yes, perfect. This is another Mark Knopfler number. Uh, it's called uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, so, uh, shall we? Hello, Sir Romeo. Since a Saturday. Loving everybody low With a love song that Finds the street light Steps out of the shade Says something like You and me, baby I'm Juliet says, hey, Romeo You nearly gave me a heart attack As underneath the window She's singing Hey, love, I'm a boyfriend's dad shouldn't come around here and singing up for people like that Anyway, what you gonna do about it? Juliet The dice was loaded from the start And I bet And you exploded in my heart And I forget, I forget The movie song when you're gonna realize it was just as the time was wrong, Juliet. We come upon different streets, both the streets of shame, both dirty and both mean, and the dreams they were just. 
And I dream your dream for you And now your dream is real How can you look at me As if I was just another one of your deeds When you can fall for chains of silver You can fall for chains of gold You can fall for pretty strangers And the promise is stay home And you promise me everything You promise me thick and thin, yeah Now you say Romeo, you know I used to have a scene with him With Juliet When we made love you used to cry Said I love you like the stars above And I love you baby till I die There's a place for us You know the movie song When you're gonna realize it was just the time was wrong Thank you. Thank you. I have not practiced thank this much. So much. So. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you. Much. It was a pleasure and I am sure a lot of people really enjoyed and uh, thank you so much once thank you. again. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's an honor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Now we come to the end of this musical rock show and we'll just take two minutes of your time and then readjust the settings of Zoom. So that we are back to the scientific program now. Yeah, all the best for the scientific program, Dr. Vaibhav. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We'll be back live in two minutes.
talking to us on a macular, submacular hemorrhage, tips for tackling the surprises. Over to Dr. Ahmad, please. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to participate in such a spectacular meeting. So my talk will be about submacular hemorrhage. So there are many causes for submacular hemorrhage, including PCV, CNV, surgical trauma, penetrating or plant ocular trauma, rupture of arterial macroaneurysm, valsalva, and coagulopathies. And there are many treatment options available, including observation for small and thin hemorrhage, pneumatic displacement, subretinal TBA injection with or without air injection, and surgical removal. The most popular modality nowadays is a subretinal TBA injection, with or without air. So in these cases, preoperative OCT is essential to exclude areas of pigment epithelial detachment or sub-RB hemorrhage because you want to inject the TBA only subretinally and to avoid injection into the sub-RB space. I start my case by uh, TBA preparation. The TBA comes in two vials, one powder and one sterile water. I dilute the powder in uh, 50 ml water then I, deal, I dilute one milliliter on uh, seven milliliter water, and the submacular dose is 12.5 microgram per 0. 0. milliliter, and you can inject up to 0. 0.3 ml. The toxic dose is 50 microgram. Connect the 41 gauge subretinal cannula to the mid one micro dose injection syringe, which is connected to the automated viscous fluid injection mode on the constellation machine. And the injection pressure should be uh, between 10 and 15 PSI, and the flow rate is titrated per observation of slow and steady drops. If you see a continuous stream, this is too much pressure. So as we see here in this video, this continuous stream is too much pressure. Adjust your pressure till you get this slow and steady drops. Then you introduce the delicate cannula carefully through the trochal to avoid its damage. In these cases, I ensure complete BVD by staining with triamcin alone because uh, basically you are creating a hole in the retina with the subretinal cannula. So you should avoid any remnants of vitreous or hyaloid at the site of the puncture by the 41 gauge cannula. This is the first case, which is a 45 years old myopic patient with a submacular hemorrhage due to Valsalva. I started my case usually uh, uh, as usual by curvitrectomy and BVD induction. Then I'm slowly injecting TPA into the subretinal space. It is very essential to do this step under good visualization and high magnification because you want to inject only into the subretinal space and avoid injection into the sub-RB space. I, I inject slowly, slowly and steadily till I, I get a macular detachment that extends beyond the border of the submacular hemorrhage. So here I injected, I, I created the detachment that exceeded the boundaries of the submacular hemorrhage. Then I'll inject also some uh, retinal air. And while injecting subretinal air, also inject slowly because if the subretinal air goes at um, a high Recording pressure, in progress. you may uh, create a macular hole. And at the end, I uh, do uh, fluid air exchange. And uh, this is the post-operative OCT after one month that shows complete resolution of the hemorrhage. This is another case, which is a, a 10 years old boy with a submacular hemorrhage after severe blunt trauma. Again, I started by uh, staining by trimcin alone, and surprisingly, the hyaloid came off easily in this uh, 10 years old boy maybe because there was a partial BVD uh, due to the severe plant trauma. Now I'm completing the uh, peripheral vitrectomy, and in, these and in these trauma cases, it's very essential to search for peripheral breaks and exclude the presence of a peripheral break because uh, the severe plant trauma may have resulted in a peripheral retinal tear like this case. Here I found this peripheral uh, retinal tear, most properly due to the severe plant trauma, now I'm doing laser to the, to the tear.
Now I'm checking the the pressure. I'm making sure that I have this slow, steady drops, not a jet stream. Then I'm now injecting the TPA till I exceed the boundaries of the hemorrhage. But in this case, I found that the hemorrhage was not too thick and was not too uh, uh, large. So I decided to only inject a subretinal TPA without air. And this is a post-operative OCT after one month that shows complete resolution of the submacular hemorrhage. Uh, but uh, the patient uh, had a, a choroidal rupture uh, due to the blunt trauma. Actually, the choroidal rupture was, uh, was not seen at initial presentation. It was hidden beneath the hemorrhage. It is very important to follow up these cases to, because these cases may develop CNV in the future. In case of extensive submacular hemorrhage, I inject at more than one side. So here in this uh, one-eyed previ previously vitrectomized patient that developed uh, a massive submacular hemorrhage due to CNV, I started injection at one location, then I shifted to another location to make sure that I, uh, I had a, uh, a complete detachment in, around the area of the hemorrhage. And at the end, I also injected uh, subretinal air. This is a 50 years old patient with a, a submacular hemorrhage due to severe blunt trauma. As usual, I in, injected uh, subretinal TBA. In this case, I only injected subretinal TBA without air. Also, I found that the, the hemorrhage was not too thick or too large, so I decided only to inject TBA. And actually, I operated this case uh, only uh, 11 days ago. And I just captured this OCT image yesterday that showed complete resolution of the hemorrhage, and there is a residual uh, sub-retinal uh, fluid that will usually resolve after a few days. And uh, my last case is a, is a very interesting case, which is a, a 65 years old patient presented with a sub-ILM hemorrhage due to a ruptured macroaneurysm. I decided to only uh, follow up this patient, and after three weeks, the sub-ILM hemorrhage spontaneously resolved, but after two months, the patients came back again with a submacular hemorrhage and recurrent sub-ILM hemorrhage. And you can see on the, uh, at the area pointed by the blue arrow that the, some areas of the submacular hemorrhage are already clotted or organized. I started my surgery by um, curvitrectum and staining by trimestin alone. Then I started doing ILM peeling to the area of uh, the sub-ILM hemorrhage. Now I'm removing the ILM. Uh, but now the view is uh, is getting poor. Actually, the cornea was dry and I was not seeing properly. So uh, I created a nitrogenic hole. And this is an important lesson. If you if you if your uh, view uh, get hazy during surgery, stop and wash the cornea or put a, a viscoelastic. Don't continue any statement during the surgery uh, during the poor visualization. This is the nitrogenic uh, hole that I created during any peeling. Now I am completing my uh, island peeling. And after completion of uh, island peeling, I started to inject, to uh, aspirate the sub island blood. I am now aspirating the sub island blood with the, um, with the flute needle and the cutter. And after removal of the sub-ILM sub blood, I uh, started to inject subretinal TBA. But uh, during injection of subretinal TBA, the TBA comes uh, through the, the atrogenic hole. I tried to inject at another location, but again, while I'm injecting, the TBA is getting out through this atrogenic hole. So I was not able to induce a macular detachment. And I think in this case, it's essential to induce a macular detachment because some part of the hemorrhage is already organized. So I decided to go further away from the area of the hemorrhage and induce a macular detachment away and enlarge the blip gradually till I reach the area of the submacular hemorrhage. But unfortunately, while I'm injecting away from the hemorrhage, the blip is enlarging peripherally and was not getting into the submacular hemorrhage. So what to do now? I decided to uh, create another blip between the submacular hemorrhage and the large blip 
trying to connect the large plate with the area of the submacular hemorrhage, but again, I failed. Now I'm injecting more into the large plate, trying to connect these together, but I failed. So I felt stuck in my surgery. What I should do now? I want to uh, detach the macula. So I, uh, I decided to do air fluid change. And I thought that the air uh, will come in into, inside the eye and push this subretinal fluid into the macula. So now I'm doing air fluid change. As you see now, the, the subretinal uh, TB is uh, in, the, in this large blip is getting into the submacular hemorrhage. And at the end, the, 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 blip, the subretinal TBE is connected to the area of the submacular hemorrhage. And I left the patient on SF6 gas. And this is 10 days after surgery, the sub ILM hemorrhage resolved, but unfortunately, the submacular hemorrhage is still almost the same. So I decided to uh, follow up the patient. And the 10 days after the surgery, also, this iatrogenic macular hole was closed. So this horizontal B-scan going through the area of the hole uh, shows that it's already closed. So I decided to follow up. But unfortunately, one month after surgery, the submacular hemorrhage completely resolved, but the patient developed a macular detachment that was extending beyond the lower arcade. And an OCT scan uh, passing through the area of the atrogenic hole shows reopening of the atrogenic hole. So the patient was scheduled for a second intervention, but surprisingly, the retina was spontaneously reattached after one week. So I was, um, I was actually surprised and I was wondering what made this retina go back into position without any intervention. So I went back again to the OCT scan through the atrogenic hole and I found this small clot of hemorrhage that was partially occluding the, this atrogenic hole. So maybe at some point of time, this small clot of blood moved a little bit and occluded the, the, this atrogenic hole and the retina was spontaneously reattached. Thank you very much. A very nice uh, talk, uh, Dr. Ahmed, and uh, it was a wonderful talk, very good images and a wonderful video. Uh, the amount of uh, uh, the submacular surgeries and submacular injections, what you have been using, is for wide indications, uh, apart from the regular AMDs. Uh, I just wanted to know, like, uh, what is uh, your indication for injecting into the submacular space? We found in certain cases, uh, whichever where you have injected a submacular uh, uh, TPA and uh, gas, uh, air. Uh, we see that we could uh, get away by even injecting just a C3F8 gas wherein we could have a displacement of the blood. So what is your indication for injecting uh, into the uh, sub, uh, subretinal space? Um, so um, really, I did not try, <laughs> I did not try a pneumatic displacement before. So uh, maybe I, I will try it in the future, in future cases, but I, uh, I don't have any experience with pneumatic displacement. Any other, uh, apart from TPA, uh, do you use any other agents which can be used in the subretinal space? Any other uh, clot lysing agents which can be used in the subretinal space? I, I only use TPA, but um, I, I came across some, uh, some reports that, um, that showed that sometimes you may only inject PSS into subretinal space, and, and this, on, this only may be sufficient in, in some cases. So let's say if you if you are doing a, a, a diabetic vitrectomy, you 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 remove the vitreous hemorrhage, then you you are surprised by a, a submacular hemorrhage, and you don't have a TBA uh, in your OR at that time. Maybe you can just inject BSS into the subretinal space, and this may help into uh, the resolution of the submacular hemorrhage. Is there any volume of blood in the subretinal space? Is it a criteria or a contraindication for injecting a subretinal this thing? Do you see the subretinal blood coming into the uh, anterior chamber and causing glaucoma and things like that in some patients? So actually in this patient, I, uh, I go early as much as I can. Uh, there is some reports that this submacular hemorrhage is toxic to the uh, photoreceptor. So some patients, maybe if you, if you observe this patient, maybe some of them, the hemorrhage will go by, by its own. But the issue is that it's toxic to the photoreceptor. So it may result in a, a bad uh, vision after uh, resolution. So I usually I don't wait in these cases. I, I usually I, I go as early as I can uh, and inject the subretinal TB. Wonderful, Dr. Ahmad. Very nice uh, listening to your talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the Very wonderful Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Over to Dr. Mithali.
Dr. Mitali, are you here? Okay, in, in that case, uh, the pleasant duty of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Rajiv Reddy Papuru, falls upon me. Welcome you, Dr. Rajiv, for your talk on retinal detachment and PVR. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And you can see my slides. Okay. So, um, uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, share my experience and doing uh, retinal detachment surgeries with proliferative retinopathy. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to show some of the videos uh, where we uh, have done a uh, few of the proliferative retinopathy detachments. So, and in that process, I'll just give a few of my experiences and what helped me in doing this. There is no one way of getting these things done. There are multiple ways and each one has their own way. Uh, and I would say what makes these uh, detachments different than what we usually do a simple regmatogenous retinal detachment is presence of membranes and uh, contraction of the retina. So these are the two things which makes it uh, set them apart from a regular retinal detachments, uh, which uh, tackled well would give you a better results when compared to not tackling these two properly. So this video is actually showing you where I'm trying to open the funnel. That's the first thing you should do if you have a closed funnel adding. So where you go to the center of the funnel and try to dissect it there and then make an opening. Once you do that, then you'll get a cleavage where you can actually go inside and start slowly dissecting to open the funnel completely. That's one tip which I would say that don't uh, make a break in the periphery to start with, but go try to open it in the center of the funnel. So which will uh, give you a proper plane for you to dissect it out. And you may be injecting a little bit of a PSCL into that opening and that starts opening up the uh, funnel and then start peeling the membrane as well. So that's one thing which I would say uh, help you in uh, dealing with uh, proliferative retinopathy with the closed funnel detachments. So the next one is dealing with uh, membranes. And, uh, when you say proliferative retinopathy, membranes is implied. And we see a lot of membranes where they can be seen clearly like what you see here. So I would always start with posterior to anterior dissection of membranes. So uh, one advantage when compared to diabetic uh, membranes in these cases, they're usually not a vascularized membrane. So it's relatively easier for you to peel it off when compared to diabetic membranes where peeling is not the way with that easy because they have uh, stuck to the retina with the vasculation. So you have to cut them. But these ones, if you get a correct hold of it and then try to peel it off, always do a tangential uh, peel. Don't pull it up to the uh, center of the vitreous cavity. Hold the membrane and try to peel along the retinal surface to the periphery, which will help you to peel off the membrane more completely uh, than going and picking it up multiple. Like you see that I'm not pulling towards the vitreous cavity, I'm going towards the periphery. So that's what removes the membrane uh, more easily than pulling it up towards the vitreous cavity, which might cut off the membrane. Then again, you have to go back and hold the membrane again. So that's a uh, thing which you should always remember when you're doing a membrane peeling in these cases. So one more point which we need to remember whenever we're doing a membrane peeling in periretinal membranes is this, that's presence of an anterior PVR. So most of the times, so this is a ciliary body area which we are seeing here, where retina is pulled up with an anterior membrane and it's that causing the retina to get stuck to the ciliary body. So dissecting these membranes are important in two ways. One is if you don't identify this membrane and try to put up, uh, settle the retina, so though you have removed most of the membranes posteriorly, retina looks clean, but you will not be able to settle the retina because the retina is pulled up in one area. So we will start causing 
subretinal tear which start when you start setting the retina causing a tear is in the retina when you try to forcefully try to attach the retina there second thing is uh, identifying and removing this part will help you in managing the hypotonic post operatively in these cases which is seen more often mainly because this peripheral membrane will cause damage to the ciliary body and causing a long term hypotony and we will not be able to remove the oil from these patients and then ultimately uh, you might uh, end up attaching the retina by cutting the retina in the periphery but you will not be able to salvage much in this because of the hypotony which is a set sin and continues for a long time so that's important to identify the anterior pilar so that's the second uh, pearl i would say that uh, identifying this and removing it to the extent possible is important the third thing is uh, identifying the subretinal membranes so uh, you see that subretinal membranes are seen in most of the pvr cases uh, one thing which we need to remember is uh, it is not necessary to remove all the subretinal membranes when you want to set the retina but at the same time if there is a uh, need for subretinal band removal uh, it's important to do it and uh, you may have to make a retinotomy in an area where you can actually easily access these membranes that's a identifying the site of uh, where you want to make a retinotomy in these patients is important so that's what is shown in this video so i made a retinotomy there and the left side where the membrane was seen there which is causing the retina to be stiff there so that's what we identified and we have removed all the periretinal membranes i was trying to peel from the opposite side so it was finding it difficult to hold so i went from the same sclerotomy so that's what actually gives you better access to that membrane and uh, you can hold the membrane and try to gently pull it off you don't have to do any forceful action most of the time it comes off sometimes you may have to roll it off so that it comes out easily well so moment you remove that you can see the retina has become uh, flapping there so that means the retina has got released so that's an identification which gives you that yes the membrane peeling for subretinal is good enough for you to settle the retina in there if you go after the subretinal membrane even if it is not uh, causing much of a uh, pull on the retina or uh, retina in cases where it actually going through the macula which might result in uh, uh, decrease in vision post operatively so that's the case where even if it's not causing a retina to tint up you might still end up going and removing those membranes like what you see here so we could have settled this retina even without it but then if you see this there is a band which is going right through the macula and fovea area to leave that there like that you might be able to settle the retina but then visual prognosis in this case will not be that good so that's the reason why we made a retinotomy here and then again and go inside and try to pull that membrane gently pull it off but if you try to pull forcefully uh, sometimes you might even create a retinal break in posteriorly and we need to be careful when you are trying to this is what i was talking about rolling off the membrane uh, if you don't take uh, precaution while you are doing it uh you might actually accidentally pull the retina uh into the uh membrane there and try to cause more tear uh, than what it is what you could have managed without it the gentle pull not a forceful pull is uh, something which you should always look at so so that's something which you should always remember when you are dealing with the subretinal membranes so we dealt with the preretinal membranes anterior proliferation subretinal membranes so you removed of all the membranes what you could practically possible so now then you are left with uh, a retina which you should be able to set law easily but what happens is uh, this is a case of trauma with corneal scar and then trying to settle the retina remove off all the membranes but uh, once you have uh, set removed of all the membranes when you try to look at whether you can still settle the retina you see the retinal folds which are still fixed and that's something which might not let you settle the retina so uh, i do a diathermy especially to the larger blood vessels and you connect it uh, uh, with uh, cutter so you what we call as 
postal stamp retinectomy where you just make multiple holes in the retina using a diathermy and then connect it all through. And always make sure that you don't cause too much of a bleeding when you're cutting this. So that's the one thing which you should always remember when you're doing a retinectomy. So another tip about doing retinectomy is when you try to settle the retina, you use it a low uh, pressure, uh, air pressure at a lower uh, level rather than using it at 25, 30, I use it somewhere around 15 to 20. So that uh, when you are doing uh, the fluid air exchange, the retina is not forced back onto the choroid, uh, that the, uh, where it can cause uh, tear in the retina. So uh, if uh, the pressure is low, what happens is what we have seen here. So when you're trying to settle the retina, where the, where the, see the arrow mark there, the air starts, slowly starts going below and you see the retina is still uh, stiff there, it's not going back. So that means the retina is contracting and it will not go back. So that's where you can actually go there and extend the retina to me a little more so that you can actually settle the retina without causing much problem, uh, without causing a tear. So there's controlled uh, retinal attachment and uh, extending the retina to me where it's required is important. So another thing which we should always remember when you are doing a retinectomy is, so once you uh, do a retinectomy, you might be able to settle the retina, but while managing the anterior flap is another thing which is very important. If we don't remove the anterior flap, this tends to roll up and goes towards the ciliary body and causes uh, fibrous proliferation. It can result in a new vascular proliferation in the periphery, sometimes even cause uh, ciliary body pull and hypotony resulting in anterior PVR. Though the retina is set, uh, attached well and causing, uh, it would still cause a long-term hypotony or sometimes a uh, neovascularization of the iris because the retina in the periphery, which is uh, uh, cut and left around, is going to cause uh, proliferation of uh, tissue there. So that's another thing which you should always remember when you are doing uh, uh, membrane uh, uh, retinectomies when these cases in the proliferative retinopathy. So other than that, uh, settling the retina once you have done that is quite simple. So, in short, tackling the membranes and uh, releasing the contracted retina and putting the retina back in position are the main things which will differentiate the proliferative vitro retinopathy uh, from uh, regular retinogenous detachment without a proliferative vitro retinopathy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. Really lovely videos and uh, you simplify the topic by dividing it into its various steps very nicely. Um, just you know, a few uh, questions if you have time. Um, any role of uh, you know, or in your preoperative assessment, when do you, when would you decide to use a belt buckle encirclage in these patients, or when would you avoid it? Um, encirclage is when uh, I see one thing is uh, whenever I see a pediatric. Uh, cases with a proliferative retinopathy, I would definitely try to put uh, encirclage mainly because I might not be able to get a complete PVD to the periphery and I might not be able to dissect off membranes that easily. And uh, if I see a too extensive membranes and we feel expected uh, a contracted retina in it, then I might not put the uh, encirclage in those cases mainly because. Uh, I know that most likely I might end up doing a retinectomy, so there's no point in putting an encirclage in these cases. Fantastic. If any of the other moderators have a quick question, then we can take that. Yeah, I would like to ask you, Dr. Fakuro, uh, how extensive you manage to do the retinectomy if you have too much of uh, subretinal uh, strand like that? If it's too large, isn't it better off to do retino retinotomy, very brief retinotomy, to put the retina down with uh, PFO? Yes, uh, subretinal bands never uh, make me do a, a large retinectomy, actually. So like what I was showing, I just make a retinotomy there locally and try to remove all the subretinal bands and you might be able to settle the retina most of the time. The reason why I will do an extensive retinectomy is because of internal contraction of the retina rather than a membranes. So that's what I was talking about. Uh, an incomplete membrane peel should not be an indication for a retinectomy. Yet I would say you have removed all the membranes and then you may have to consider doing a uh, retinectomy. Thank you so much, Dr. Bapuru, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, 
We'll move on to our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andre Ruban. Uh, Dr. Ruban has completed his residency in ophthalmology in Kiev, uh, Ukraine, and he's subsequently defended his PhD successfully in collaboration with Columbia University. He is currently the president of the Ukrainian Vitreo Retinal Society, and he, was, he has founded and was the head of the Department of Minimally Invasive Vitreo Retinal Surgery at the Academy of Postgraduate Ed Education in Kiev. Welcome, Dr. Andre, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, one minute. Mm -hmm. Did you see my presentation? Yes, Dr. Andrew, we can see it. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for kind invitation. It's my great pleasure. I'm going to talk to you about uh, our experience with infusion related jet stream complication during small growth vitrectomy and how we prevent it. I have no financial interest. So 52 year old man with full sickness macular hole and without any concomitant systemic disease was submitted to vitrectomy using 25 gauge vitrectomy uh, in constellation system. During the posterior vitreous detachment, the cutter was disabled and a high aspiration was applied next to optic nerve. At that moment, a sudden vascular occlusion noted to the optic disc followed by blood flow interruption in the main arterial in macular region. Fortunately, during uh, additional island peeling, also suddenly began spontaneous blood flow recovery. Post-op macula hole closed with improving BCVA to 2032. Second case, a 62-year-old woman with diabetic retinal detachment underwent revisional surgery using EVA machine by DORC. Note that pronounced vascular occlusion on the optic nerve occur only during active aspiration. What is the cause of the incidence? Obviously, that a significant decompression generated by high aspiration creates so-called jet stream effect. Why did this happen? We know that almost all modern vitreal machines have an intraocular pressure control system. Uh, this is really a tremendous advantage in a small gauge vitrectomy. So Integrated pressurized infusion with intraocular pressure control compensates and provide control on infusion pressure within plus minus two millimeter gidrargium, resulting in more predictable, more efficient surgery. But if you press on the pedal and aspirating a lot, the intraocular pressure control will automatically move more volume through the infusion cannula to compensate for increased aspiration resulting in not only for greater stability of the posterior segment, but also jet stream effect. Dr. Leandro Zacharias, one of the first who reported intraoperative infusion related jet stream enlargement of the macular hole during higher aspiration. Ahmed Belgin published four cases, iatrogenic retinal breaks caused by excessive infusion fluid flow and recommended using an intraocular pressure control 
about four milliliters per minute, and be careful during especially scleral, scleral indentation. Here is a very recent post from Mohamed Taufik about a case of heterogenic retinal brace with retinal detachment caused by jet stream infusion fluid flow during fluid air interchange. The consequences of excessive gas infusion during vitrectomy have also been published Sam Young, who demonstrates the higher air fluid flow during air fluid exchange may result a significant retinal damage in nasal part. Sylvia Bob also emphasized that mechanical damage secondary to infusion air is a causative factor for in the development of postoperative visual field defect. In such retinal damage usually occur, occur contralaterally to the infusion cannula and strongly influenced by infusion pressure. How can we prevent infusion-related jet stream complications and thus eliminating retinal damage during small gauge vitrectomy? First, try to avoid abrupt and extensive aspiration during vitrectomy. Second, Redirect irrigation jet performer per performing angle insertion of the cannula. Aim the infusion should not point to the posterior pole. Or use new cannula design to provide scatter the infusion air or fluid and reduce the speed of the irrigation jet. Akira Hirata, almost 20 years ago, developed 20 gauge infusion cannula designed for the purpose of redirect and scattering the fluid and air infusion to reduce retinal damage. The tip of the cannula was closed and an additional four opening on the sides were made. We have modified such a cannula for 25 gauge vitrectomy. Total flow volume with the new cannula was equivalent to that for the standard 25 gauge cannula, but mean air fluid flow velocity with new cannula was significantly lower. And final recommendation, always keep the cutter in front of the jet in fluid air exchange. You can also change settings. For example, in Constellation Machine, delay the influx and reduce it. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that uh, knowledge of the causes and understanding of the mechanism of development of jet stream infusion complications will allow surgeons to increase the safety and efficiency of our surgery. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Andre. That's a very uh, important point that you brought out. And I think uh, it's something that we don't really pay attention to uh, with the very dramatic case that you had, uh, you, you experienced. And I think you're, you were aware enough to pick up those signs. Many times we may not even notice those signs if you're concentrating on the ILM feeling and other uh, you know steps. I think you were uh, very quick to recognize that something was wrong, and then you could you know uh, keep a very close follow up on that. So um, I invite anybody to offer their comments as well. Any experience that they may have had similarly, and you know we can have a, a discussion on other people's experiences also. I would like to ask maybe someone have experience, maybe bad or maybe good experience with such complications. Uh, uh, on my own, I can say that I've had a uh, bad experience when I was, uh, when the infusion pressure was high during the fluid air exchange, so as to hasten the procedure of fluid exchange, although I was using a flute needle for the fluid exchange in a, a macular hole, I uh, elevated the pressure to 45 millimeters of mercury while doing the FAE, and then subsequently, when I went in with the brilliant blue to stain the ILM, uh, while I was injecting the brilliant blue, the assistant realized that the pressure is still at 45, which had missed my mind, and he immediately dropped the pressure down to 20. 
so that caused the injection to suddenly become wow. very forceful and the blue went straight through the retina created an hydrogenic break and went into the subretinal space so yeah. the yeah the, the awareness of the pressure and the uh, aspiration and the cut rate at all times at all steps i think is very important as a you know uh, in this kind of surgery yeah it's really maybe not so so uh, vi visuality is such problem but uh, even with experience we understand that uh, know the small things or very important things all our action it's very important especially dealing with machine unfortunately for me for example i am not so expert in technician uh, questions uh, dealing with uh, machine or constellation or something uh, another kind of machine uh, but it's very important to know the possibility how to dissolve how to dissolve this uh, problem and uh, it's also we, we should to, to do it to should to know and to do it I do recall uh, very well another patient of ours who we had uh, operated during my fellowship. Uh, my teachers are also here and part of this panel. Uh, the patient had a giant retinal tear with the macula still attached, and the preoperative vision was six by six. He, uh, he underwent vitrectomy for the uh, uh, giant retinal tear, but postoperatively the vision had dropped down to hand movements. Probably some intraoperative uh, uh, pre uh, intraocular pressure elevation, which resulted in. Uh, uh damage to the optic nerve um and you know subsequently the also the retinal circulation probably though there were no no visible signs at in the immediate post operative period so one should always be aware that these are you know potential side effects of any surgery yeah unfortunately we uh, saw in a publication uh, published some uh, uh, this complication in patient with macular surgery it's maybe more predictable more quickly more with a good vision but unfortunately, the losing of some kind of field, of, of visual field, is very, uh, it's terrible after operation when patient suffered from 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 losing some some field of view. It's yeah, it's it's, it's necessary to understand it and maximally predict it. Dr. Andre, just another quick question. You know, we we are now dependent upon the fluidics of the machine as well as the fact that we're using valve cannulas, which compartmentalize the posterior segment. In the past, when uh, valved cannulas were not uh, commonly used and we had an op sort of open chamber, we would probably experience a lot more hypotony, not these incidences of high intraocular pressure. But I think in, uh, in, in at that time, we probably didn't have this jet stream effect or this, uh, you know, um, complications of vascular occlusion as much. Yeah. Unfortunately, a valve club, I mean, it's a very important thing, but it's not uh, protect from this complication. Uh, even if system is closed, it is uh, unfortunately also we visualize and uh, and uh, and this complication will be unfortunately. Great. If anybody else has any comments or uh, questions. So I also encountered a jet stream injury, and this was like uh, the uh, the dye cannula was blocked during the macular surgery. And so when you try to apply a force, it immediately goes with a lot of force. And in my case, it went and hit directly on the macular hole, and the size of the macular hole almost made, made it three times the size. And suddenly the prognosis of the case from the group went immediately to a worse prognosis, and uh, it was not a very good functional outcome, though the macula got closed, the hole got closed. Then you also have to be careful while injecting your uh, dyes that uh, one, again, you have to have the cutter in front of it and make sure they are not blocked while uh, injecting it. But very nice presentation, Dr. Andre. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andre. And now, uh, thank is you. Dr. Rajita here? Dr. Divya, it's a pleasure yes, to welcome Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Venkatram, I'm here. <laughs> uh, great, Rajita. Nice to yeah. hear you. Good, e yeah. uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure to um, invite our next speaker, Dr. Divya Balkrishnan. Um, my first mentor, I would say, and uh, a surgeon and teacher par excellence. She's working presently at uh, Little Flower Hospital, Ankamalli, Kerala. And... Um, 
she has a lot of publications and presentations to her credit so without further ado i think let's listen to her on one of her uh, pet proficiencies that is pediatric retinal surgery tip and tricks uh, over to you ma'am Oh, I'm not able to share the screen. Yeah. Are my slides visible? Yes, yes it's visible. Yeah. It's a great honor to be at this wonderful symposium. and I'm very nice and happy to see my teachers and students too so i'll be presenting few surgical tips in pediatric retinal surgeries uh, why the pediatric eyes are little different because of its anatomic variations because it's a small size and a small orbit underdeveloped pars plana but of a normal size lens and a very adherent vitreous gel and uh, the pediatric retinal eyes are different the retinal detachment because of its various etiologies which result in these uh, tractional exudative or uh, combined retinal detachments the various indications in infants include range from uh, retinopathy of prematurity fevr uh, persistent fetal vasculature and in children uh, mainly retinomatous retinal detachment uh, could be because of uh, most common causes marfan syndrome stickler or coloboma and trauma is another one so before going to the surgical pearls it is very important to have a good pre op evaluation in starting from history trauma is one of the most common misleading history in many of these cases and it is very important to rule out life threatening conditions like retinoblastoma which can present like high fema or vitreous hemorrhage so a good ultrasound should be done before taking these cases for surgical intervention and vitreous hemorrhage is another common presentation always look for underlying conditions like retinoschisis regressed retinopathy of prematurity or fever and to come to a, a diagnosis or get a clue take a good birth history family history do a screening of the family members in suspicious cases of fevr or retinoblastoma and examination of the other eye gives a clue so this uh, lower picture shows that uh, patient presented with vitreous hemorrhage and the left eye had shown some rpe changes and intraop it was shown that the patient child had vitreous hemorrhage secondary to retinoschisis so a good ultrasound is very important before taking these patients after a history a good pre op ocular and systemic evaluation systemic is evaluation especially to rule out conditions like marfan's homocystinemia or incontinentia pigmentae anterior segment examination look for any signs of neovascularization check intraocular pressure coming to fundus examination do a good pre op evaluation under anesthesia preferably do scleral depression and see areas of anterior retinal drag and this is important because you need to take a decision whether you need to do a lensectomy or not and to position your sclerotomies so as to avoid areas of anterior retinal drag and accordingly you need to position the surgeon position and in pediatric eyes as i mentioned the pars plana is underdeveloped so especially in while doing cases of retinopathy of prematurity you are entering to the plas plicata so this is a rough guide as to uh, place <coughs> sclerotomy depending upon the age and when you operate babies of around 6 months the sclerotomy distance should be 1.5 to 2 mm as a rule of thumb 8 uh, months the pars plana is 2 mm poster and uh, so here this uh, top picture shows that uh, the baby was taken of rop at 6 uh, months and you could see that the sclerotomy is placed at 1.5 while the lower the baby was 5 uh, years old and the sclerotomy was placed at 3 mm and again position of the sclerotomy again it is decided by way, which area the retina is dragged to and you should avoid entering through the anteriorly dragged retinal area and the direction of the entry of the trochar is also important and it depends upon whether you are planning a lensectomy or not associated with that so this picture shows the left eye of a baby uh, intra picture where the retina was dragged temporarily 
So to uh, have an ease of uh, dissection, the surgeon decided to sit on the right side and place the sclerotomy. You can see that the infusion in the left eye is placed infrotemporal, but the other ports are made superior and infronasal. And you could see that the entry was made vertical entry because this was a lens sparing vitrectomy and it was easy, easy to access these membrane without crossing the midline and to uh, avoid any lens injury. So this position of the surgeon and the sclerotomy are decided by the area of retinal drag. In this case, in this case, you can see that this is a stage 4B and you can see the retina is dragged anteriorly just behind the lens. So here we need to do a lensectomy. So you can see that the direction of the entry of the trocar is into the lens so as to avoid injury to the retina. And the sclerotomy, this is a right eye and you can see that the sclerotomies are placed nasally and it uh, avoided the temporal quadrant. And the dissection is done under direct microscope visualization. And when you do direct microscope uh, uh, visualization dissection, then you, you can see that in the right video, an external light pipe illumination can be used as an extra uh, source of illumination for uh, your ease of dissection. So this, it's important to place the distance, decide on the distance, position of the sclerotomy and surgeon position depending upon the retinal drag. Now, as I mentioned, the second component is the adherent vitreous. So it is very important that these babies can have vitreoschisis. And uh, you might think that, you may think that the PVD has been complete. You can see in this video, it looks as if the PVD is complete. And the surgeon proceeds with the anterior vitrectomy. And now, to remove, when, when the surgeon goes to peel the fixed membrane fold, could see that there is one more layer of vitreous which is there. So always keep a watch for vitreoschisis and complete PVD induction to be ensured in these cases because this could be a cause of recurrent uh, retinal detachment. So here, how the triamcinolone helps. You could see that when triamcinolone was used, it could nicely stain the very thin adherent posterior hyaloid and it helps to identify this thin membrane. When you operate on cases with a combined exudative or traction retinal detachment, always remember not to make any iatrogenic breaks or any internal drainage retinotomy, especially in cases like FEVR, Coats disease, or retinopathy of prematurity. So you can use an external drainage in case where you decide to do a subretinal fluid drainage. So here, even in fakie case, an AC maintainer can be used safely, especially in those cases with bullous retinal detachment where the retina is behind the lens. And one tip is that you can place the AC maintainer in the same quadrant parallel to the limbus where we are draining. And it is important to maintain a good intraocular pressure during the drainage so as to ensure complete drainage of the subretinal fluid. And the drainage has been done in the other quadrant. So you could see that the AC maintainer has been placed in the other quadrant. And Maintaining the intraocular pressure ensures complete drainage. And in cases of familial exudative vitreoretinopathy, very challenging situation because these can have layers and layers of vitreous. Here you could see that there is two, three layers of vitreous sheets. So it's important not to miss these various layers of vitreous when you handle these cases of retinal detachment in FEVR. And always remember, in periphery, the retina is avascular, and it is very important to induce PVD in this peripheral retinal detachments. Hence, it is required or it is mandatory to put a belt buckle, preferably, so as to support these avascular peripheral retina because PVD induction would be very difficult in these cases. So here you could see that layers and layers of vitreous. And sometimes you can use triamcinolone acetonide in these cases so as to visualize these adherent vitreous. And because the peripheral retina is very thin, bimanual dissection may be preferred when you do, uh, do dissection of these peripheral membranes in these cases. So here you can see post-surgery, the membranes has been removed and don't expect the retina to become flat immediately on the table or immediate post-operative period. 
you give some time for the retinal fold to settle and even in these cases do not make any internal internal drainage retinotomy do good membrane peeling remove all traction do laser to the peripheral avascular retina and just give some time and the retina will settle down with time and as i mentioned remember to put belt buckle you can use the trimcinolone acetonoid or brilliant blue to assist ppv and always remember of vitreous cases in these cases and you may use a bimanual dissection for peripheral membranes and one more thing in fevr is that when you do peripheral laser because this macula is dragged to the periphery uh, keep a watch on the fovea and not to uh, burn the uh, fovea in the periphery and avoid any internal or drainage retinotomy and do remember this is a progressive disease so make sure to follow up this patient and the patient will be with you for life now coming to another condition which can cause retinal detachment is retinoschisis and the key point in uh, operating while operating this retinoschisis is because these can have multiple outer retinal holes and it's very challenging to identify these holes so a good pvd induction trimcinolone acetonide because sometimes it is very difficult to induce pvd over the inner schistic layer so here in this case you can see a peripheral retinotomy is there retinal break iatrogenic was there so try to settle the retina by doing a fluid air exchange through the peripheral break you can see the multiple sieve like outer breaks in the temporal and you could see that still the temporal retina is elevated so the key is that you can make an internal drainage retinotomy corresponding to the area of the outer retinal hole so that to ensure complete drainage and it is important to do laser to all this laser, uh, multiple outer holes and even to the most posterior outer retinal hole because otherwise post operative after silicone oil removal it is high chance of recurrence of retinal detachment so the key is to identify the multiple outer retinal breaks in this and uh, th this is one case you can see there are multiple out outer retinal breaks and uh, preferably to make a retinotomy over the area of the outer retinal broke and uh, one more thing is that when this inner retinal schisis wall if you have not removed during the surgery and um, post operatively you might still see that the inner schisis might be lifted and that doesn't mean that the retina is detached always you should check that the outer retina remain attached and if you have any doubt you can do the uh, time our uh, uh, laser uptake uh, test to uh, see whether the outer retina is still attached or not and when making uh, retinotomies in rheumatoidogenous retinal detachment in pediatric eyes better to avoid very posterior retinotomies or inferior retinotomy because the children won't maintain prone position so there is a very high chance of recurrence preferably drain it to the anterior most break or make a superior retinotomy another condition which can which requires surgical intervention is persistent fetal vasculature it can be either combined uh, anterior or uh, a posterior a good pre op evaluation with the b scan would help to uh, decide whether there is any anterior retinal drag or not so this is a case where you can see that you can see the stop just behind the lens you might think that it might require a lensectomy but when you see there is a clear space between the stock and the posterior capsule so you can safely enter your cutter behind the posterior capsule and release all the traction and make sure you do a good cautery over the stock so as to avoid any vitreous hemorrhage never pull these membrane because these will have peripheral strong adhesions which if you are not very careful would create peripheral anterior breaks so you can do cautery and when you do posterior dissection always keep in mind that the retina can be dragged anteriorly into this stock so should not create any iatrogenic posterior breaks you can use trimcinolone and brilliant blue to see whether your vitrectomy has been completed and uh, here ilm peeling has been tried but because retina was very thin there could not complete the ilm peeling in this case actually and i'll show you that uh, in this case always make sure the peripheral retina is examined because you can see in this there was in the nasal periphery there was a small area of retinal drag and a small suspicious break so always a good peripheral evaluation is indicated in these cases here when you plan for a lensectomy then the entry should be uh from the limbal root because if if you enter through the anteriorly dragged retina then you might lose the case here you can nicely see the 
long ciliary processes. So not to pull these, but cut it with the cutter. And once you have removed or gone around the stalk, then an infusion cannula and these sclerotomies are placed. Now with the depression, you can see that the stalk is attached, in fact, anterior to the ora serrata. So you can nicely depress and remove this stalk carefully without injuring the retina. So it is very important to a good depression after your lens removal, preferably before placing the sclerotomies so as to avoid any injury to the anteriorly dragged retina. So here you could see that the retina, the stalk was attached in the past planar region and not in the aura serrata. So you could see that the stalk fell back and uh, you can trim it and cut it. So to conclude, so the pediatric eyes are a little different because the retinal detachment happens because of various etiologies. And each of these has different ways to tackle and each point to remember when you operate these eyes. And uh, it's a teamwork. It doesn't end there with your surgery. So you have to counsel the parents and uh, you have a good, you should have a good rapport with the pediatrician anesthetist to take up these high-risk babies and uh, follow up these babies with the pediatric ophthalmologist and low vision clinic and visual rehabilitation center. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that excellent talk, excellent uh, videos as usual. Uh, just wanted to ask, ma'am, when uh, say you have uh, injected, because we know the hyaloid is like very adherent and as you said, the shysis also will be there. We generally, when we inject the um, um, translone once and try to pull it out, sort of disperses, comes out. Sometimes I've noticed that we feel like, as you said, we feel that we have actually um, induced a complete PVD, but um, we haven't. So in that cases, do you re-inject transalone or you use uh, uh, blue? Um, we can do, uh, both the things actually. Even if you re-inject transalone, if it is if it, uh, posterior vitreous is still adherent, you will see that when you try to aspirate, it will be stuck to there, stuck to that membrane. So trimsilone itself can be injected. It can help. Okay. So so you inject uh, uh, this one uh, our uh, dye only when you are planning an ILM pill or to look for vitreous also? I usually use trimsilone. In very okay. rare cases, I inject even uh, a brilliant blue to see if the vitreous has been completely removed. Because when you try to do for an uh, ILM peeling, uh, the vitreous will uh, be stained with the brilliant blue. Mm. So you won't get to see the ILM, but you see the vitreous. Yes. So if you I have get any that patchy kind of, uh, yeah. Um, any questions from uh, uh, the other faculty, the participants? May I request Dr. Uh, Ruban for... Uh, okay. Let we have just a question. Uh, get a, a question, yes, quick question. Yes, to stain with uh, the blue, brilliant blue, the uh, uh, ILM, how often you do that when you have such uh, <laughs> uh, uh, detached retina? And how, uh, how do you uh, stain? You stain uh, before you put the PFO or you usually stain after you have the PFO in? Uh, I I prefer not to use PFO as far as possible in these uh, babies. So I do after vitrectomy, I directly put uh, Brilliant Blue. I do peeling without using PFO. Okay, but uh, what if the retina is just uh, you know detached and then moving forward and you don't have control over it? And uh, don't you think you could use a, a little bit of PFO and then uh, just remove it? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You, we can do that also. But I, I feel like comfortable better to do uh, without PFO. Many times I do it without PFO. And I start peeling it little from nasal to temporal because that will give me a better control in detached retina. Yeah, great. Congratulations. Great cases. Thank you. Dr. Can I, Duban, your yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. It's it's a beautiful surgery. Great case. I am impressed, greatly impressed. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, using silicone oil in pediatric cases. 
how often in your hands it will be and uh, uh, which kind of silicone do you use usually in such cases? Uh, in all, all, in FEVA cases where there is no break, I don't usually use any tamponite. It's just at the end, I do a fluid air exchange. In cases of retinose cases, RD and other retinal detachments, especially if the breaks are inferior, then I prefer to use silicone oil. And uh, I use like 1000 uh, centi stock or 1300. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for all the speakers, the moderators and the panelists for an excellent coordination and lovely surgical talks. And, uh, and I'd like to uh, hope that, that the panel stays on for the next session, also and enjoys the next session and gives their input. So I'd like to call upon the next session, uh, the Retinosome Special Session. And it was founded by Dr. Hatsun Nakamura, the Retinosome Specialist. And uh, we like to introduce our panel the first moderator, Dr. Divyansh. Can you take over? Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. Uh, hi, thanks. Thanks, Weber, for making us part of uh, this webinar. It's uh, really interesting. So, uh, introducing our uh, next speaker, Dr. Zelia Maria Correa, uh, who's a, a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Miami Health System and co director uh, Ocular Oncology Services. Her interest is in ocular oncology and especially in melanoma and retinoblastoma. Kindly do uh, uh, take over the session, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the very honorable invitation. Um, I offered a bunch of different um, alternatives for presentation, and it seems like the panel is very interested in looking at how I manage idiopathic choroidal effusion. As you can imagine, choroidal effusion is um, an entity that actually comes to me as a differential diagnosis. Many a times we see patients with small pockets of choroidal effusion and most of the time, you know, when they get to me, they really have this diffuse coral effusion. Um, I don't have any relevant financial disclosures, but I do consult for Castle Biosciences and Immunocore here in the United States. So my objective is to present a, the surgical outcomes of patients with coral effusion and discuss the benefits of additional intravitreal therapy to enhance these results. So first, I present to you a patient, a 79-year-old woman with vision loss after tube shunt for glaucoma. And, you know, the glaucoma doctors didn't really dilate her. She had a really small pupil. And, you know, and, and the question was when she finally complained about that vision loss and they saw these large elevated lesions, patient had a previous history of systemic, you know, um, disseminated um, metastatic disease. They thought, well, these are metastasis. The patient comes to me. Her visual acuity was 2100, but the ultrasound was very, um, clarif you know, clarifying. It was very elucidative where you can see the um, glaucoma shunt reservoir here. And very clearly, you can observe the choroidal detachments and the posterior thickening of the choroid. So, but I'm going to come back to that one. I want to show you another patient here. And this patient was a 78-year-old woman with blurred vision as well. Initial visual acuity, 2200. She had a bit of a pocket here of choroidal um, detachment that was more prominent, but she also had this diffuse choroidal detachment. She presented with, you know, also some retinal detachment and nonspecific uveitis. She was a diabetic, hypertensive, and had recent weight gain. And then we'll talk about more, a little bit more about that in a minute. And her social history was non-contributory. She had a past medical history of cataract surgery, and she had been already managed by the other um, ocular oncologist here in the program with multiple injections of sub t analog that was giving her temporary mild to moderate improvement, but with recurrence as soon as the steroid washed out. This was her OCT. You can already see some changes here um, in um, the RPE and Brooks membrane. You also observe similarly to what you saw with the other patient. This part, here's the choroidal detachment. Here's more of a retinal detachment and the very visible thickening of the choroid there. So this is, this is how we manage her. We did the um, classic um, 
I'm sorry, the classic um, scleral windows as described by Golan Payment many, many years ago. And they really work very well. The way I do it, I mark about six millimeters um, on each side, always posterior to the muscle insertion. As you're seeing there, I try to open a flap that is about 80 to 90, 90% of the thickness you can see there. I want to see that grain of the, the sclera as I'm removing that tissue. And you notice that the important thing here is to really find a good plane of dissection. So some of us, it's it's a little bit harder. Those of us that were trained doing scleral buckles with you know the old scapins technique, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be that daunting. And here's the second one you're observing there. And so I open preferably four scleral windows, one in each quadrant. They're just showing how the scleral windows look. And at the end, I just cut it off. But I think the important thing here is to observe how thick the, the scleral wall is and the depth of those scleral windows. So um, this is the patient one month after surgery. You notice that significant pocket of choroidal fluid here is gone and you notice significant improvement of the serous retinal detachment which takes us to adjuvant pharmacological treatments that we can do to enhance those results. I personally don't like to use a lot of um, triencinolone or triessence because of the peaks of intraocular pressure we observe in these patients as I showed that first case, which is not this one, the patient had already a glaucoma reservoir, and it's pretty daunting to think that we're going to give them triencinolone, and then they might just do another peak of high intraocular pressure. So I favor using Ozerdex. I really like those implants. The dexamethasone does not increase the intraocular pressure so significantly, and it has a more long-term um, release of the medication, more constant. So here's the patient two months postoperatively. You notice the serous retinal detachment. Now it's very shallow. The choroidal thickness is improving here. You can see a little side of one of the scleral windows. You notice how much thinner the eye wall is compared to this side. And you see the little Ozerdex right there. Two months after surgery, we can see a significant improvement there um, for this patient and very, very satisfactory outcome. Here's the patient seven months after surgery with complete resolution of both choroidal detachment and the serous retinal detachment, and her final visual acuity was 2025. For the other patient, I could only do three um, scleral windows because obviously supratemporally she had her glaucoma um, reservoir and I could not mess with that. I was fortunate enough that I was able to open the conge and manipulate the three other quadrants without disrupting the glaucoma surgery. Here's the patient one month after surgery with complete resolution. I hope you can remember those big pockets, almost kissing choroidals that you saw. And here is the little Ozerdex implant vision 2030, and she is doing really well. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this, these two cases with you. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Fantastic cases and uh, really fantastic surgeries and the outcome were really beautiful. So uh, some questions which I wanted to raise was, what is the end point of the scleral flap? As you showed, uh, we, we need to see that little gray gray zone, whether that's the end point or you want to dissect much more deeper inside. So what would be your take on it? So that's a great question because early on, some people even went as far as really opening the eye wall and, and draining, physically draining those choroidals. I haven't really seen a substantial, um, you know, benefit to that because it does add the risk for choroidal bleeding. So you can have a lot of complications if you drain, especially if you drain so posteriorly, because draining anteriorly is not going to help you. You know, you really have to go post-equatorial. So um, in my experience, it, it really doesn't matter. Maybe it takes a little longer for that coronal detachment to settle down, but it will eventually settle down. So my endpoint is really that kind of 80 to 90. I need to see that graying. And as I'm dissecting the video, unfortunately, doesn't do it justice. But you start seeing fluid leaking out of that, you know, of that thin sclera. So, so that's when you know, okay, it's working. As I'm finishing the, the, the flap, I almost start, you know, the, the, that kind of 
foreign is there, it starts to fill up with serous fluid. So that's when I know, okay, this is really where I need it to be. I have in the past for cases that there was a question of, um, you know, coronal lymphoma or a patient had a history of systemic lymphoma and there was some concern that, you know, that the coronal effusion wasn't really just a simple coronal effusion, but it had a neoplastic background. I have opened you know, at the edge of my scleral window and taken a piece out of that choroid. But again, it comes with a lot more complications. And I like to close it again, because I am trying to avoid the flip side of that, which is, you know, um, hypotony. And, you know, and, and if you have something leaking there, it may take a while to close. So I do suture that. But by and large, I think the benefit of not kind of violating the eye is that number one, you don't have the risk of, risk of bleeding. Number two, you don't have a risk of hypotony or other complications, and it's a much more controlled surgery. I have a case that I wasn't able to share in which the patient presented with a very thick cord, a choroidal detachment, and a funnel RD. And so what I did for this patient is I staged it, and one, you know, I went in, took the floor scleral windows, I passed a buckle, and then I brought the patient back about a week later when that or it was already kind of draining, already thinning out. And then I opened and I um, kind of opened the funnel and I reattached the patient. This patient, fortunately, is now, I think, almost a year out. And, you know, I haven't taken the oil out yet because the patient is very insecure to take the oil out. And But he's doing great. So that was a case that I thought, well, you know, with this funnel RD, it really will be helpful to have a drier, thinner choroid in terms of having a success for reattachment. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. And thank you. Thank you for the comments. Yeah. So if any other uh, faculty or uh, our colleagues have any questions, we can ask. Uh, Zilia, congratulations. Great cases. And I uh, just want to ask you about the Ozurdex. How, how you choose your patients that deserve Ozurdex in? Well, you know, um, currently I'm doing, I'm, I'm in, in, inserting an Ozodex in every single coronal effusion case that I do. And it really helps a lot. It helps also with not having to give the patients such long-term topical steroids. So um, if you consider the fact that there are some, um, some authors out there, some researchers that think that coronal effusion may have an autoimmune background. Um, I personally think that these cases, usually they have some peculiar historical points. A lot of them have had recent significant weight gain, um, some hormonal changes. And my, my caveat is that all of these patients, and I have done even bilateral choroidal scleral, you know, windows or, or yeah, it, these patients have very short necks. So when they sit down and I see that kind of stout sort of um, physique and recent history of weight gain and everything, I, I always think, this, this is going to work really well. Now, there are a kind of a, a group of scleral effusion patients that don't have a thick sclera, but I have honestly not encountered that. I think that that's more related to like a pachychoroid um, syndrome or complex, but not the actual diffuse choroidal effusion. Okay, thanks. Thank and, you. Uh, I would like to introduce you if uh, there is no more questions uh, for Zilia and uh, Dr. Diveni. I mean, <laughs> Dr. Wai Chim Leng, Dr. Diveni, he was his associate uh, professor, my professor as well. And uh, I'm very happy to have Dr. Wai Chim Leng, my great professor here. Uh, he was my uh, retina professor back in Canada years ago, and now he is in uh, UBC. He spent some time in Hong Kong, and now he's back to uh, BC. And uh, Dr. Lem, it's a great pleasure to have you again into the retinosome session. This is a special one. And uh, I know you're gonna see patients uh, shortly, and I'm very happy to, happy to have you here, and uh, you could present your case. Thank you, thanks very much, Hassan. Thank you for the uh invitations and uh, it's really an honor to participate 
with this uh, special with an awesome. And um, I'm going to um, share with you a um, interesting case that um, I was managing. And um, so often when you deal with the um, um, pediatric cases, they, they come with a package, meaning that they may be syndromic, they may have multiple other system involvement. So this, uh, this case has actually a quite complex anterior and posterior pathology. It's a two-year-old boy with bilateral pedis anomaly, which affect his uh, cornea. And at the same time, he also has concurrent uh, uh, FEVR and uh, microthalamus. And unfortunately, despite the period surgery, the left eye has become NLP. You can see the pictures shown here in the um, in the slide that the actually getting to be physical with a very decompensated cornea, despite have the uh, period penetrating keratoplasty, he had developed traction retinal detachment despite surgery. Um, he still has a the total retinal detachment. In his left eye, is his only seeing eye at this time, has two uh, corneal graft, and uh, because of the corneal decompensations. Um, at the same time, because of the posterior segment pathology, he also developed uh, anterior traction from uh, the uh, uh, proliferations and resulting displays retina uh, anteriorly and tractions to the temporal periphery. In addition, he also developed some pupil membrane posterior to the corneal graft. A few months later, um, the cornea unfortunately started to decompensate and the eye was hypotenuse. And the reason for that to happen is because of those anterior tractional band has caused things cyclic membrane that was pulling the cerebral body and resulting detachment of the cerebral body. So after some discussion, the decision was to go ahead to do another Keratop, uh, penetrating keratoplasty, uh, keratoplasty because of the coronary decompensations. And we will try to um, do the endoscopic uh, dissections of the uh, psychotic membrane prior to the uh, corneal um, graft done. And um, the intention to try to relieve all this membrane. You can see on the photograph here, the quite a significant anterior, and there's some posterior uh, membrane, but there's a very dense peripheral membrane. And um, so I'm going to show you the video. So this is the endoscopic view of the um, um, anterior portions of the uh, uh, eye. And you can see there's psychotic membrane. To, so under the endoscope, we were able to dissect that off. And, uh, and that was successful to uh, temporarily kind of relieve the. Um, um, kind of the pressure in the eye and it has improved. Unfortunately, th three months post op we can see there is progressive uh, uh, posterior pole detachment because of the uh, membrane uh, developed posteriorly. And uh, you can see there's very dense ribotic membrane causing the retinal folds and, um, and traction to retinal detachment. And um, so we decided to go ahead to do it because of the anterior displacement of the uh, retina, the decision is not to go through the uh, plus planar or plus guitar, and you sh we try to use the uh, limbo approach. But the difficulty with the limbo approach, you can see already that the cornea get edematous very quickly. And uh, in, in addition to that, is when you approach the posterior segment, um, it can cause a lot of uh, distortions. So it makes the dissection very, very difficult. So there was an attempt to, to do those membrane and, uh, and it was very hard and we need to do a kind of bimanual approach. So uh, another part was created, the system would try to use the uh, light to do it. But at this point, you can see the cornea is really, really cloudy and, and it's no longer possible to, uh, to do the surgery. So fortunately, uh, I was able to recruit my anterior segment surgeon to help. And uh, so he quickly come to the operating room and uh, and help us to uh, open up the uh, the cornea. And uh, so we have converted to a plasma retractomy to an open sky retractomy. 
And as we all familiar with the history of uh, vitrectomy, old pan sky vitrectomy is actually the first technique that we done uh, during vitrectomy. And this allowed um, bimanual approaches to the um, uh, to dissect the membrane. You can see um, there is very very extensive membrane throughout the uh, the retina, both anterior posteriorly. And um, you can help the illumination using the uh, endoillumination endoillumination to to um, uh, then improve the um, this kind of um, view of the retina during the dissections and uh, but as you go deeper it's getting uh, it's is even harder so uh, so i decided uh, now here using the uh, the biome and um, the biome allow you to go deeper into the um, posterior segment where the light of the microscope or when your view is limited and um, you can see after a furthermore dissection you can start seeing the um, um, the posterior pole better and um, further dissection is done. You can now see a bit of the macula, some of the optic nerve, and um, we then open up further with the, uh, the visible elastic. Now you can start to see some anatomy because we didn't prepare for the corneal graph, so uh, uh, we, we just have to suture back that same cornea uh, to, the, uh, to the eye and allow the cornea to recover and possibly do another uh, penetrating character pass later on. So a bit about the open sky retracting is something that uh, uh, we don't do very often, but uh, it is certainly advantageous when you have a very extremely small eye, especially uh, when you have a lot of anterior pathology, when you can do a closed system by inserting the instruments through your routine Plus placata or plus planar wood. And um, as I mentioned, the limbo approach, although it's, uh, it's safe, it does has very limited um, uh, advantage because the cornea get uh, edematous after about 20, 30 minutes, and, uh, and that could start limiting your view. And uh, by using the open sky, as you can see, that um, approach that we can allow a bimanual dissections for the adherent membrane. But it's important to understand there's also some limitations of this approach is that the wrists are hypotony and uh, the pharyngeal ring is good to uh, able to suture in place. And it's definitely um, important to have your anterior segment corneal surgeon uh, helping you out because we are not trained in that particular area and having a colleague helping you will be advantageous. And other complications are supercoroidal hemorrhages, especially for the prolonged hypotony. That, that means you need to uh, economize your time. You need to do what you need to do and uh, get out as quickly as possible. And uh, as you have heard from previous uh, pediatric uh, surgical approaches, that the idea is to attach the posterior pole. It may not be uh, possible or necessary to repeat all the anterior attractions. And fortunately, in this case, uh, we were successful to do what we have to do to reattach the posterior pole, allow this child to have ambulatory visions. And um, well, thank you. Dr. Lam, this is such a tough case. And uh, we have to consider the corneal graft, the hazy media. And after you did the, the surgery, you know that the other eye uh, got physical. So in this case, if you are trying to avoid sciences, for example, but of course the outcome is not good at all, would you left, leave the patient with a silicone oil and then that could make it difficult to follow up with a B scan because you know it does not, does not, uh, it's not good with... Uh, and so uh, would you better uh, leave silicone oil or just uh, uh, return the patient for a, a later graft? Yeah, uh, good questions. And um, it's always a uh, kind of uh, difficult decisions. You, you have to, bear, to weigh the uh, risks and benefits of using uh, silicone oil, for instance, in this case. Uh, this kid is a fake kid and uh, he already have quite a bit of corneal uh, decompensatory problems. So leaving silicone oil in will definitely compromise the cornea uh, easily. And, and secondly, um, the majority of the problem that 
this child has so far is tractional detachment, has no rheumatologist component. So the only benefit of the silicone oil is maybe is to keep the pressure up a bit. And uh, um, so in, in thinking over the kind of the risks and benefits, um, we decided silicone oil may not necessarily be the best approach. In fact, that's why we went in to do this, uh, the uh, dissection of the psychiatric membrane to try to improve the cerebral body functions, and that could help to um, maintain the intraocular pressure rather than having additional risk uh, with the silicone oil. Okay, and uh, did the patient uh, yeah. has an outcome for a graft, a little one? Yeah, um, this, uh, this cornea was able to survive for uh, uh, a good um, three to six months. And then um, um, when it started to decompensate, the anterior uh, segment surgeon uh, took over and uh, repeat the graft. But the problem is that um, this is a uh, lifetime um, challenges, especially with such a young child with the underlying um, uh, multiple um, anomalies. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Lam. For a very enlightening talk, you made a difficult surgery look easy by step-by-step -step maneuvers. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Lam, for a very uh, interesting and a very, very challenging case. I am not sure how many of us would like to take up that case for surgery. So moving on to the next speaker, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Vishal Rawal. So Dr. Ravel did his vitro retina fellowship from Shankar Natrala Chennai before joining LVP. And he had later done his international ophthalmic research fellowship in ocular oncology at Kohl's Institute Cleveland Clinic under Dr. Arun Singh. And he has multiple peer-reviewed publications and he's uh, constantly presenting at various conferences. His uh, areas of interest include uh, diabetic retinopathy, retinal detachment, and ocular oncology. And we will be very happy to have a talk on coronary melanoma from him today. Over to you, Dr. Ravan. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. I think there is a lot of challenging and surgical tips which I have learned through the presentations from the different authors. I was asked to present something very unique, something challenging. And being an ocular oncologist, we do come across tumors in our part of the world, not as common as melanoma, what we see in the Western Caucasian population. But melanoma is one of the intraocular tumors where depending upon the size as per the comms classification, we do treatment. The standard of care for the melanoma, as you all know, is plaque bracket therapy. However, in few instances, in some desperate situations where the plaque bracket therapy is not advisable or not indicated, there we come across and do some kind of intraocular interventions in form of endoresection. So I will be sharing a video. So Ravi, we can't see your screen. Yeah, one second. Give me a second. Not able to see my video on the desktop. No problem, sir. If you like to take a few minutes, you can take that. Uh, I can involve the next speaker. In the meantime, you can set up a video. Yeah. Thank you. You're fine. Thank you.
Dr. Abdullah, are you there? I I have this pleasure to invite Dr. Vivek Dave. Dr. Vivek Dave is my teacher and a lot of us teachers who's a very dynamic clinician scientist from Elvi Prasad Institute. And he has to his number more than 100 peer reviewed publications in national and international journals. And now he's a known man from Telangana to Taiwan. Dr. Vivek Dave, state is yours. Thank you, Vaibhav. I think that was a super kind international uh, sort of an introduction. I hope I'm audible clearly. Yes. All right. So thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone uh, from whichever part of the world you have logged in. I've been given a topic uh, titled Penetrating Trauma with RD, uh, Pandora's uh, Box. Now, a Pandora's Box, as you know, is a metaphor in our modern language and uh, the proverbial phrase refers to a source of endless complications or unexpected occurrences. So what do I have in my box today? Three cases, uh, all three are related to trauma. All three of them will have retinal detachment. Each is a unique situation and uh, we will attempt to go over uh, their management approach and uh, see some observation and uh, learning points. So case one, a 40 year old male post corneal tear repair elsewhere, two months before the presentation to us was diagnosed at that place as uh, inoperable retinal detachment with the notes mentioning retina is incarcerated and inoperable. And the patient uh, was uh, then referred by a local physician to us uh, for a second opinion. Now, this is what uh, the eye looked like. So if you see, this was uh, the corneal wound which was repaired. And if you can see here, few of the sutures were removed uh, locally. This is the fundus photograph. It's not very clear, but uh, you can see that uh, most of the retina is attached. But uh, right here, if you can see, uh, the retina has a fold which sort of goes towards the wound. And this is the area which was incarcerated right anteriorly uh, into the wound. And this patient was a fake. Egg. So we made a diagnosis of a repaired corneal tear stat status post uh, penetrating injury with retinal detachment and incarcerated retina. So I go ahead, try to clear out the muck and the first uh, Pandora's boxes uh, element right there in front of me, the wound was still open. Though the sutures were removed, the wound integrity was not there 100%. So I had to go ahead and uh, repair the corneal tear first. So something which I had not prepared myself for, but then sometimes you have to do it. Then a belt was passed uh, all around as shown, uh, following which uh, a vitrectomy was started and the anterior vitreous was cleared so as to clear out the vitreous over the incarcerated retina. You can see the fold here. The retina per se was pretty lax other than the fact that the fold was entangled in the wound right anteriorly. So you go ahead and you do a release of uh, the retina from that wound. And now you can see that retina is pretty lax and you are already relaxing that uh, this is going to be a cakewalk going ahead. PFCL is being uh, injected. Retina starts uh, settling down. And then while I'm injecting the PFCL, the second element comes up. A small air bubble gets released from the PFCL cannula, comes anteriorly towards my left hand. I get irritated. I sort of attempt to remove it quickly. And what I get is hemorrhage. So this is what happened. My instrument got stuck in the choroid and tore it apart. So something which I felt was a trivial sort of a maneuver, but it had real big implications and now I had lost all visualization. So I fill up PFCL again, the residual fold of the retina, I do a small radial retinotomy to release it. So that part of the retina falls back well. And uh, now I would think I would go ahead and do a laser and then replace uh, this with air and then silicon oil. But moment I attempt to remove the PFCL, again, there is this spurt of blood. So this is a fresh hemorrhage right from the choroid, which is not allowing me to remove the PFCL at all. <clears throat> I made a few attempts. I waited on table to see if uh, this clots down, but this was not to be. So I had no other option but to leave PFCL uh, in the retina 
fill up uh, the entire eye with pfcl do my endo laser and then close the eye with pfcl in situ this is how it looked like uh, in follow up this is around 3 weeks down the line with pfcl in situ now this uh, in my practice is the upper limit to which i leave pfcl in the eye so this is the point at which uh, i decided to replace the pfcl with silicon oil so on table this was the eye with pfcl you can see that the retina is well settled no more hemorrhage everything has clotted down and healed well so you go in and a simple process aspirate out uh, all the pfcl and then uh, replace it with air and subsequently do a silicon oil exchange this is what i was left with in a silicon oil filled eye this uh, patient is actually from a different city up north in new delhi and uh, is likely to follow up later for silicon oil removal but uh, just to demonstrate uh, that a few things uh, can happen in trauma if you have a previous wound you should be sure that you check that wound well and once in a while uh, you may require to revise it choroidal bleeding due to instrument touch especially in trauma where tissues are sometimes inflamed or you have a choroidal detachment or you have compromised visualization or in my case sometimes when you are possibly in a bit of a hurry and uh, you may you know sort of uh, make a wrong move you may end up with a choroidal bleeding if that happens pfcl can be used as a tamponade and as we know pfcl can be left behind you can always come back to fight another day and then exchange that pfcl with oil and salvage the situation so we go to sec the second case uh, which was again a repaired corneal tear elsewhere also had endophthalmitis following a penetrating injury retained intraocular foreign body and an edematous cornea which was precluding a good posterior segment visualization this was the presentation to us uh, in our clinic uh, you can see that the corneal wound uh, was uh, sutured uh, albeit here it possibly was closed down under some amount of tension there may have been some tissue loss exudates uh, in the anterior chamber no real great view uh, through the cornea and if uh, we would have had a slit lamp slit we would have seen that all this entire cornea in the center was uh, Uh, highly edematous b scan showing lot of uh, retained foreign bodies and uh, also a partial pvd that was seen in the superior scan now in my practice uh, when encountered with a, such a cornea which is uh, hazy due to edema i take an endoscopic approach because uh, i feel that allows the cornea to have one opportunity of a natural clearance so if you go ahead and replace it with a keratoprosthesis or a penetrating keratoplasty you basically have not given the host cornea a chance to clear out on its own so i go ahead uh, endoscopically as you see once inside all these exudates are very well seen amenable to very good clearance and then as you encounter in trauma sometimes you may find weird things so here i find an eyelash uh, in, in between uh, the exudates right at uh, the end of the eyelash uh, i track down uh, foreign body and as you saw in the b scan there were multiple foreign bodies so i move around hunt for more of them and uh, actually i find multiple ones of different sizes and shapes so foreign body has been released so now you want to go in with a magnet and pick them out and you are again relaxing mentally that the day is done but unfortunately these were non magnetic i take my magnet and to my dismay none of them gets attracted to the magnet at all so i come back in take an ilm forceps because the routine foreign body forceps was too large for these uh, foreign bodies so just take an ilm forceps spread out its prongs a bit and you can actually make it into a foreign body forceps i bring it up rest it on the iris and then from an sics wound remove it uh, using a mcpherson's forceps so one foreign body out i think i'll go back in and remove all of them but unfortunately the site of impact gave way and what i see now is a bullous retinal detachment inside with a few foreign bodies still remaining to be removed the fact that uh, vitrectomy was adequately done helped me here so i could put in pfcl and push back all this uh, bullous retinal detachment adequately enough to flatten out the posterior pole at least till the equator so now that allows me to visualize the foreign bodies again and now i pick them up again one by one same maneuver bring them up deposit them on the iris take a mcpherson 
and then remove them go in again and repeat the same process again till each and every one of them has been removed once uh, that was done i looked out for uh, a break i found a horseshoe tear peripherally through which the retina was flattened first by a fluid fluid exchange and then by extending the pfcl all across i completed the 360 degree endo laser this you can see now the retina is well attached well lasered and once this was done the pfcl was replaced with air and then sequentially with the uh, silicon oil this is what the eye looked like the uh, this was around i think a month down the line you can see that the cornea is beautifully cleared out now if i would have done a keratoplasty here i would have made this person a post pk patient for life and possibly put him at a risk of graft failure uh, if you remember he was a young person so a lot of life to live with a graft uh, in c2 the retina was well attached uh, vision was not very great it was 4 by 60 but if we look at uh, the presentation with which the patient had come i think i would take 4 uh, by 60 uh, any day quirkily i think this was one small piece of uh, hair uh, which possibly i did not pick up uh, on table and is now jutting out there on the fundus photograph so in this case the pandora's items are that visualization in retinal surgery is paramount if media is not clear endoscopy can be a game changer rd can occur at any time during surgery especially after the iofbs are removed because the impact site may be a full thickness site ilm forceps can be used as a modified foreign body forceps for small non magnetic foreign bodies they work well and pfcl as we know is an important third hand on table uh because often these detachments when they rise up they are bullous because of fluid movement and the fact that the vitrectomy was complete before uh, the detachment occurred now quickly going to a third case uh, this is not something which we encounter unusually but i think uh, this has an optical learning point so post scleral uh, tear repair patient with retinal detachment and uh, dispersed vitreous hemorrhage now vitreous hemorrhage here was adherent to the crystalline lens capsule so if you can uh, see i am holding uh, this eyeball and you can see these parallel streaks of hemorrhage that are adherent to the posterior lens capsule now as we induce a posterior vitreous detachment to take off the posterior hyoid of the retina a similar maneuver can be done even anteriorly to separate this hemorrhage because it is in the anterior hyoid phase to separate this from the crystalline lens so if you see this is what i am doing after having done a vitrectomy around uh, the posterior aspect of the crystalline lens then i just put the cutter off engage all of this anterior hyoid and the hemorrhage and pull it peripherally and backwards so this sort of induces uh, the opposite of a pvd and avd if you want to call it so this is very safely done and in my experience doesn't harm the posterior lens capsule at all so you will see uh, the pre and post photographs of uh, this maneuver and uh, notice how nicely we have been able to achieve the entire clearance of uh, the lens so once this was done uh, largely rest of the case is simple you clear out the hemorrhage you deal with uh, the retinal detachment look for the break now here because i could not find the break i have made a drainage retinotomy and then flattened out the retina but always keep in mind that the regmatogenous retinal detachment that was present primarily would possibly obviously be having a break and if you are not seeing anything then try to examine under air because air acts as a concave lens and it is likely to give you more visualization of the periphery so that is what i do here i get a good visualization of the periphery and on slight indentation i am able to see the ora serrata area and here if you can see i have picked up the peripheral break which can be cryoed easily and once cryoed the rest of the steps uh, in terms of uh, replacing the air with uh, silicon oil are uh, you know standard steps so finally the pandora's item in this last case uh, would be that post trauma detachments can have associated vitreous hemorrhage which can layer the posterior lens capsule anterior hyoid detachment using a cutter in uh, suction on cutter off mode is a safe maneuver for clearing this hemorrhage expect breaks near the ora especially in clean looking post open globe injury detachments and a fluid air exchange allows for a greater visualization of the periphery due to the concave lens effect that is induced by the air in the posterior segment so thank you very much uh, for all your kind hearing and uh, i'll be glad to take uh, questions if any thank you vivek great cases and the first one 
after you stitched the cornea, you still got such a good view from the fundus with that wide angle uh, picture. That was awesome. And uh, I like to operate on uh, fake patients. And uh, I do pretty much what you did. I avoid touching the lens by zooming it a little more, as you did. And so I, I, I kind of pull the vitreous towards the cutter so I don't go towards the lens. And so in this way, I, I get the vitreous down. And uh, that's the tip. Otherwise, the surgery wouldn't go on well. You would be having a hazy media due to posterior capsule op opacity. But you did it perfectly. Congratulations. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vivek, for a lovely presentation. Very crisp and precise. And thank you, uh, thank you very much. Any uh, due, due to slight delay in the schedule, uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Dr. Vishal uh, Rahul, sir, are you ready with the presentation? Yes. Yes. You can see your screen now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll be sharing a video of surgical intersection of portal melanoma. <laughs> Hello everyone. In this video, I will be discussing about endoresection of large choroidal melanoma. This is a case of a 32-year-old gentleman who presented with complaints of seeing brownish shadow in his right eye for the past one month. On examination, nasal pigmented large choroidal mass with overlying hemorrhages with exudation was seen in his right eye. Left eye fundus was unremarkable. This scan image showed a mass lesion with horizontal basal diameter of 11.5 mm and a vertical basal diameter of 9 mm. Based on clinical features and imaging findings, a diagnosis of portal melanoma with retinal invasion was made. Full body PET scan revealed no abnormal uptake elsewhere in the body. Considering young age and 20 by 20 visual acuity, patient was opined for options of enucleation as plant therapy is not advisable in large tumors. And endosection, section, though rare, but done in certain cases as reported in literature. In this video, you can see novel endoresection of large portal melanoma. Three ports are being made, followed by core vitrectomy. PVD induction is being done here. following which rest of the vitrectomy is completed. Here, PFCL bubble is being injected over the posterior pole. Cutter is being used for endoresection of the tumor. see the tumor size is being reduced gradually. Here bare sclera with multiple portal tissue is seen. Scraping is being done to remove as much as tumor tissue as possible. is being done. Now endo laser is being done all around the tumor. High power of 600 milliwatt with long duration is being used to laser the base of the tumor. Following that, air oil exchange is being done. Histopathology section showing cluster of tumor cells having spindle cells to epithelial like cells with conspicuous nucleoli and melanin pigments containing cytoplasm was seen. These features were consistent with pigmented neoplastic lesion. This is a post of Dave and Funders photo showing lasered tumor margins with bare sclera nasally. Visual acuity was 20 by 80 on post of Dave 1. 
This is a post of one month photograph showing stable retina with epiretinal membrane seen over the macula. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, the important points which I wanted to highlight regarding the unique surgical endoresection of choroidal melanoma is particularly related to instrumentation. I think the most important is use of wall cannulas because always in any case of intraocular tumor, the risk of... You're not audible, uh, Dr. Vishal? Yes. You're not audible, sir? Uh, he is uh, audible to me, Weber. Okay, sorry. So the risk of tumor seeding is very, very important. I think in that case, use of wall cannulas is going to be very, very helpful. Second, use of PFO bubble over the posterior pole in order to prevent any intervent uh, risk of bleeding coming of deposit over the fovea or the macula. Third, very, very important point is use of heavy cautery, particularly on the scleral bed, so that in any inadvent small remnants of cordial tissue which are left over the scleral bed can be easily cauterized using your diathermy or the laser buns. And last but not very least is the use of heavy density silicon oil so that there is a long-term tamponade effect on the uh, uh, retina. Uh, the important point particularly related to literature is related to use of fluid air exchange in these cases because the, the literature has just reported few cases of fatal air embolism, particularly when in cases of doing large endoresection of melanoma because of the torn vortex veins where through which the air can pass through the vein, venous system and into the jugular vein. So I think that thing should be kept in mind. And in any case, wherever you feel, instead of fluid air exchange, you can do a direct PFO oil exchange so that that uh, complication of fatal air embolism even though it is very minimal, but can be avoided by doing a direct PFO oil exchange. I don't have any great experience of doing endoresections. I have done only a couple of cases, but this is something which I feel can be done, particularly in cases where your plaque brachytherapy is not advisable. Even though there are not any large randomized studies doing direct comparison between two techniques, but at least the terms of recurrence, I think both have got similar outcomes in terms of uh, local tumor control as well as recurrence. Thank you. Dr. Vishal, great case. And uh, uh, it's a interesting way how you resect the tumor. And uh, I would like to have a comment from uh, Dr. Zilia on that because uh, she does that much more than, than us here. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to comment on your case. A beautiful surgery. It really makes for a very nice video. However, I have to disagree with you because, you know, it, primary endoresection of any malignant tumor is extremely dangerous. And you put yourself and you put your patient at great risk. So I, I do urge you to consider that this the endoresection should not be a replacement for radiation, but perhaps a supplement for radiation, meaning radiate first always. And then if you cannot achieve the ideal apical dose for that tumor, then you go ahead and endoresect it you know, but not as a replacement, especially if you're scraping the base of the choroid with a malignancy, you can be pushing these tumor cells in the normal choroid and the choroidal circulation. So I, I, like I said, it makes for a beautiful video. You're certainly a very skilled surgeon. I mean, I do these all the time, but I do these in a setting of an extremely large tumor that I have not been able to give the full apical dose, but I treated the base. I treated at least to the halfway point. So then doing that is easier. I always have to use very high pressure inside the eye when you're doing the endoresection. So the cells won't be kind of, you know, shriveling around. So you have to kind of pack it up. And, and, and that's basically what I have to say. If you're not, you know, if you're not taking care of radiating first, you put yourself in a very vulnerable position and your patient, most importantly, your patient, you know, because if the tumor is already metastatic and the patient developed metastasis, you're never going to know if it was your surgery or if the patient was going to metastasize anyway. I hope, I hope you take this in a positive way. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. 
can i can i ask a quick question if we have time uh, webber sure please yeah uh, vishal i mean this is a naive question from someone who doesn't really handle oncology but just to take a parallel uh, from the ocular surface once they reject the ossn now many a times on the surface they give sort of a alcohol wash to take care of all the residual cells obviously you cannot inject alcohol in the eye but uh, uh, given the large base of the tumor that was there that was rejected uh, there is a possibility that some of the other cells may have been left behind so from a vitreoretinal point of view is there anything that we can do to sort of kill off whatever is left behind i think what you can do is a combination treatment you can do the endo resection and then after one month you can put a plaque brachytherapy because now the height of the tumor is such small so then you can use your ruthenium plaque what we usually use in india for our melanomas as compared to iodine plaque what the western caucasian population they use so in that context now your ruthenium plaque can be easily put over the area of the tumor well it would be safer to do the other way around to radiate first and then endo resect because if you wait a month between your surgery and the radiation it's a month window that you're giving these cells to gain the outside circulation and metastasize so again i'm sounding <laughs> like the old lady guy sorry about that yeah. but 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 just take that into account and and really figure out a way to sterilize before you handle the tumor Surgery is still just as beautiful, but it's just so much safer for the patient. Thank you. Thanks, Vishal. Thank you, Dr. Kodia. So, just a small comment, uh, Vishal. So, if we have entered inside, have we taken a, a biopsy and sent for a genetic analysis just to understand the risk factor? Yes. So, we don't have in at least in India, we don't have the GEP analysis as we do in Western population. But what we have is the histopathological grade. which showed only spindle cells so it is not an epithelioid so at least we know as compared to epithelioid it is not very kind of worse prognosis in terms of metastasis risk but the follow up is still only a year now so you know the melanoma the risk of uh, metastasis at least till 5 years we have to see how the metastasis risk is end of happening so just a short follow up one year it is very difficult to comment on the metastasis right now sure thank you uh, so uh, what uh, dr mahesh does is to do brachy as madam suggested and do a barrage and then take up uh, for a resection so but yes uh, the studies have proven that the five year survival is equal uh, not sure thank you thank you oh, thank you Uh, good evening everyone and uh, it's my great uh, honor and privilege to be part of this meeting and i am i would like to introduce uh, dr mohammad ahmed taufik who is a vitreo retinal consultant at the giza memorial institute for ophthalmic research in egypt and he is an md from the banha university egypt with a fellowship of uh, royal college of surgery of edinburgh and he also has a very vibrant youtube channel uh, which uh, dr webber only recommended to me and i have been following it since uh, so over to you dr taufik we'd like to see uh, your interesting video thank you i had great honor to be invited for this a great meeting and i uh, enjoyed all the uh, videos and presentation uh, i will uh, share my presentation now is it okay it's audible yes yes you see a presentation perfect so i will speak about uh, my approach uh, for intraocular foreign body removals now i am going to remove the foreign body for through the anterior chamber by different ways so i will go through for a couple of cases this is the first case with the traumatic cataract with intraocular foreign body i remove the cataract with the fecu and then go with the cutter to remove the posterior capsule and at this point you need to winding the posterior capsule as much as you can and when you feel free that the posterior capsule is a is a good be widening so go and complete the vitrectomy and this is a, a a small tip here be sure that all the vitreous is cleared because you don't need any vitreous in your pathway from posterior to anterior and when you see the foreign body don't engage the foreign body by the catheter until you remove all the vitreous and this is done by posterior hyaloid detachment 
move all the vitreous and you will see the, the foreign body is now free from any vitreous attachment. And also don't go rush and engaging with the foreign body until you remove all the vitreous from the vitreous cavity. Because when you go to engage the foreign body with the vitrectomy probe, you don't need anything touching the foreign body while you go from posterior to anterior. Now we go for the high vacuum and engaging the foreign body with the vitrectomy probe, build up the high vacuum, go up, and switching the microscope and the biome to anterior segment, keep holding the foot switch to a high vacuum, and go through the posterior capsule opening and put the foreign body over the iris, what's called iris shelf technique to putting the foreign body in the anterior chamber. And at this point, be careful that you didn't release the vacuum until the foreign body is over the iris, because if you are release the vacuum before this point, the foreign body will fall down. And then you go for uh, by from the main incision and engage or uh, catching the foreign body by any foreign body forceps or any forceps so you will feel free that it will be hard. At that point, you can implant three-piece IOL with optic captures. The three-piece IOL will be put in the thalcus and the optics will be put in behind the anterior capsule and the three-piece will be good centralized and uh, you don't need to put it in the back at that point. When you start, this technique and your posterior capsule opening is this small, there is a chance of the edge of the posterior capsule opening to hit the foreign body which attached to the vitrectomy probe. So be the, the make the widening even. and then complete your vitrectomy indentation, searching for any misty break like this, and finish your case. I will show a little uh, series of cases that uh, we can do this technique also with a larger foreign bodies, not only a small metallic foreign body. The vitrectomy probe can hold the foreign body even if it's uh, large like this. And also when you put the foreign body over the iris, you can choose any type of forceps. What we are achieving uh, uh, for this technique is that we didn't need to open the sclera and we go through for 23 gauge vitrectomy or 25 whatever you need. Also, if you have a complicated cases with traumatic iris uh, trauma with the uh, intraocular foreign body, at this point also, I remove the, cat, the lens even if it is not cataracts. Make the anterior capsule a little bit small and make the posterior capsule a little bit bigger because the anterior capsule, you need it for the optic captures for the three piece and the posterior capsule, you don't need it anymore. So you make the posterior capsule opening is a little bit more. If you catch the foreign body with the forceps and you go through the anterior chamber, there is you can make the posterior capsule opening a little bit small because you are controlling the holding of the foreign body from the retina going up to the anterior segment. The holding of the foreign body with the vitrectomy probe, it's okay, but it's will struggling with any movement. It's uh, the any movement or anything hitting the foreign body over the vitrectomy group, it will fall down. Again, completing the vitrectomy and be sure that you're having the induction of posterior hyaloid to make the foreign body free from any vitreous attachment. Because if there is a vitreous attachment to the foreign body, it will be difficult to hold the foreign body and engage it over the vitrectomy group. As you can see here, this is a larger foreign body, not a, not a small metallic foreign body. When I feel that all the vitreous attachment is released from the foreign body. Now I will go for engagement. Again, very high vacuum, engage the foreign body and go anteriorly. Don't release the vacuum at this point. When you are very focused, when you're shifting to the anterior, you can put it over the iris. And also at this case, I put it over the capsule because there is no iris at this point. So the capsule is it's enough for me to put the, uh, the foreign body over it. And also go for the anterior segment from the main wound and using the foreign body forceps to engage the foreign body and take it out. At this point, we have a small tip here, make the fluid, uh, the infusion off, because you don't need any fluidics is going up when you go for the main tunnel to uh, from the main wound to uh, engage the foreign body. Put the three piece in the sulcus and at this, at this, uh, in this case, I also uh, try to uh, do like um, 
what called single pass through for through technique for uh, pupilloplasty. So I do also pupilloplasty, and this is the pictures of the case after uh, finishing the uh, the two weeks after the case. The pupil is very rounded, and the, the vision of the uh, of the patient is much more improved. Uh, I need to for you to have the situation over this case. At this point, if you see the overlay uh, appear in the the video. The vacuum is low, this is 300, and I load the vacuum when I go to the anterior segment. At B, and at that point, the foreign body is falling down. And I have a two cases for the foreign body is falling down. So first, don't lose the vacuum when you go anterior. Keep holding the vacuum and make it to 600 or 500. Put heel on the, over the macula. So if you face this situation and the foreign body is falling over the macula, it's protected with healing. Don't put the BFC. BFC is not a protective tool for the foreign body, metallic foreign body to protect your mind. And we try it again and we are succeed to take it out from this, um, from the anterior uh, segment, like you can see. If you have a larger foreign body and you are not able to take it with the uh, vitrectomy probe, you can just widen the rocker to uh, to a 20, and we can go for the 20 gauge for force. So you, you open a new 20 uh, opening, and we can engage this foreign body from the anterior segment. You don't need to increase the size of the sclerer one to take this a larger uh, foreign body from the uh, from the sclerer. So you, I just hold it by the foreign body and take it from the anterior segment from the opposite side of the cornea so I can take it out from the cornea like this. So also we don't need to have uh, a larger sclerer one. If you have a magnet foreign body, I have a 23 gauge magnet foreign body. I go for the magnet to remove the for this foreign body from the surface of the retina to have a free engagement of this foreign body and don't touching the surface of the retina. And also, we don't need to, we don't need to increase the size of a sclerer wound. We just go for the anterior segment and it extracts this foreign body from the main wound. So I think 90% of the foreign body that you can face, you can get it out from the anterior segment as if, if you have the accessibility for this. So, uh, you just need to have help for the second hand you know, to take it uh, to take the foreign body from the anterior segment. So we published this paper talking about iris shelf technique for the management of the posterior segment intraocular foreign body, and we have a lot of series of the cases that we are using a vitrectomy probe. We are using a forceps, 20 gauge uh, uh, foreign body forces, whatever basket forces, or a uh, lot of types of uh, intraocular foreign body forceps. And uh, I am sorry to being late, and thank you. Uh, very interesting cases, uh, Dr. Taufik. Uh, my uh, personal uh, question would be, like, since you've shown to so many cases uh, using the vitrectomy cutter to pick up the foreign body, uh, like Dr. Nakamura also said that it is uh, very, uh, it may be difficult to trust the vacuum and we may yeah. have a risk of the foreign bodies falling like it did in one of your cases. So in your experience, in what kind of foreign bodies did you feel that the cutter was not enough or was unreliable? Because since you showed a lot of cases, whether it was, it was more unreliable with metallic foreign bodies or uh, wooden foreign bodies or... Uh, separate uh, other kind of materials. Metallic foreign body with a, a sharp edge. If you have a metallic foreign body with a little bit a smooth edge or rounded edge, it would be a little bit difficult to have a good engagement. If you have a metallic foreign body with a sharp edge, it can be engaged in the opening or the vitrectomy broke. But believe me, I just uh, uh, presenting like four to five cases. We have over 20 to 25 cases of uh, of the same technique for moving of intraocular body with total different types of uh, and different sizes of the foreign body, metallic foreign body, different sizes of metallic foreign body and different nature and type of configurations of metallic foreign body. Is that, uh, the idea is that three tracks. First, release all the vitreous attachment. Don't go rush and do very rush to engage the foreign body with 
uh, vitrectomy proof when there is a lot of vitreous around. Make all the media clear with the vitreous because any touch of is, is hitting the foreign body, the foreign body is falling down. Don't release the vacuum. Don't release the vacuum. The vacuum will be kept even uh, 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 if you are keeping vacuum. If you are losing the vacuum, you will lose it. You, it's not losing by him by itself. It, you will lose it. So keep the vacuum until you go for over the iris and keep it over the, the iris. If you are going with this technique and protect the macula with a heel and not the PFC, I think it's a reproducible technique and you can do it in, with any types of intraocular metallic foreign body or in any configurations of the foreign body. Uh, Dr. Vivek, uh, if you're around, uh, would you uh, also like to share what would be your approach and your comments on uh, this particular technique? I would request all the panelists and uh, the speakers and moderators, if they're present still, they can open the video and, and then we can have a discussion for this case. Uh, topic, right. such nice case. And uh, I'll tell you, I did the same. You, usually, you know, uh, that happened to me when I had this intraocular lens. Uh, inside the eye. I did not remove much of the vitreous and the, it got stuck. And a very good advice that you gave that we have to remove all vitreous beforehand. And then we take the IOL or the foreign body and uh, this is cool. It's, uh, you, you, you gotta see the vitreous and uh, that works well. Uh, you decided to use the vacuum. I like the uh, forceps because it grabs and uh, it's uh, such a message in my mind when you have the infotrochal foreign body back again into the, uh, uh, the posterior cavity. Uh, and sometimes I use uh, PFO and uh, some laminated intraocular foreign bodies with the PFO, they keep, you know, like uh, hanging that way. So it's easier to get them. And so sometimes I use the PFO, but your cases and your images we're so well. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Anson. Uh, Dr. Toffee, could you also say that uh, if uh, the uh, globe is not very intact and if the fluidics are not as per in a closed chamber, uh, this technique would face uh, certain problems? Yes. So if you have if you have this situation, use the forces. Don't trust the vitrectomy yeah. in that situation. So when you have this situation and you have not a close fluidics, don't trust the vacuum because I like I said to you, any hunt for the foreign body over the vitrectomy group, it's easy to go out. It's easy to go back. So if you don't if you feel that you are not secured with the fluidics, go ahead with the forces. You remove the choker. And widening the opening, engage it with 20 gauge, any type of intraocular foreign body forceps. And by the way, the forceps have a problem with the forceps because the foreign body is stuck over the surface of the retina. And when you engage the, the foreign body with the forceps, a little bit there is a difficulty to injury, injuring the, the surface of the retina. So also the beauty of the vitrectum proof that you, 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 you go away from this point that you can injuring the surface of the retina. So it's like pros and cons in the technique. So use it if it's if you it's if you if you see that it's a all the situations is perfect to use it. If you feel that it's you are not safe 100 percent go with the forceps. Yeah thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tafik, one question. If uh, a pediatric case with a similar kind of uh, intraocular foreign body, would you be doing the same technique or would you be uh, sparing the lens? If 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 I if it's a lens is cataractus, I will do the same technique. If the lens is not cataractus, I will go for the clearer approach, definitely one hundred percent. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent videos and very very clear uh, recording you have. Yes, Thank you, Doctor Kim. Uh, 
Dr. Weber, I think uh, we are done with this session of uh, retinos in special videos. Yeah, Yes, uh, thank you very much, the speakers, the moderators, the panelists for a, a lovely program. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'd just like to uh, say that the presentations were at par the best, and we all enjoyed it thoroughly. And we look forward to another session, uh, hopefully next year. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. And I'd like, not like to take much of time, but if anybody is present, do please come on board and uh, let's just take a picture, one nice picture with a smile. Whoever is <laughs> present there, we can just put on our videos. Thank you. This session was amazing, White Hair. Really good cases. And uh, uh, we should elect some for the best case, but uh, we're going to take care of it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, just adding to what Dr. Kunal said, I just wanted to know what recording system you're using, Dr. Coffee. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> I have a, a two operative room. Uh, one, I am, I'm working uh, with the Proveo 8 uh, Leica microscope mounted in built-in 3CC HD camera. And this is a, a, a type of uh, cases uh, that I'm showing. And the other platform is Ingenuity 3D uh, mounted over the Proveo 8 uh, microscope. So this is the two platforms that I'm working with. But Dr. Tafik is now doing uh, live uh, YouTube online surgeries. So you can yeah, like, yeah. see step by step how he's doing all the surgeries and critically. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, tough. that's a tough job for a yeah. person. Thank you, Vizab. Yes, we, we hope for the best. Thank you. Yeah, and congratulations for your birthday uh, topic. I think you... Had uh, just a three, 39, ju just 39. <laughs> no, af after 35, you start reverse aging. <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I think we can close the session now and uh, have a good day. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I have. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.